wanted to bring your attention to something that Tulsi Gabbard posted on Twitter just recently about big tech and overreaching government and political correctness being an attack on free speech, civil liberties, etc. And she says we need to preserve our American values or something at the end. Um, it's interesting then on Twitter she, she leaves out the um, political correctness uh, in the Twitter when she's writing it out on Twitter, but she mentions it in the video which is interesting. I'm not sure why that is. Um, I'm pointing out Tulsi Gabbard doing this because it's, it's actually part of a wider problem in um, the so-called left. If you can call these politicians left, I don't know. But anyway, left is sort of a relative term in people's minds. You know, some people call themselves left and they're totally for imperialism, etc. And um, some people call themselves left and are exclude, you know, certain minority groups, um, some people call themselves feminists and exclude trans women. That, that is a whole bunch of distortions of various um, terms. When we come to the issue of the Democratic Party and what they do with identity politics and how s some people on the left seem to be using that to, in some ways, I don't know if they're consciously doing it or it's sort of an unconscious thing, but it, it ends up dumping on minority groups. But anyway, um, the De Democratic Party um, often, w in anybody who's aware of how they really function, I'm not talking about clueless celebrities that think everything the Democratic Party does is great and that vote blue no matter who and all that sort of thing. And anybody pays real attention and, and does any research into what the Democratic Party does and those uh, oligarchs that are in the Democratic Party and people like Hillary Clinton and, and Nancy Pelosi and all of that, know that these people are totally on board with war. They really don't care about black people whatsoever. They don't care about indigenous people. They care about lining their pockets and um, uh, with lobbyist money from Big Pharma and health, the health insurance industry and the weapons industry and so forth. So anybody who's got a clue about the US Democratic Party probably knows that. And actually, if they do any research into them, they're as big on war as, as the GOP. They just do it in a less crass way than, say, Donald Trump. So anyway, the U.S. Democratic Party you, um, exploits identity politics. They exploit um, black people. They exploit gay people. They exploit Latinos. They, can, they will exploit any minority group, any race they can to deceive the public into thinking that they are, they support you, they support your cause, they support any sort of attacks on you or any sort of oppression of you and so forth. But in reality, it doesn't actually work like that. Um, it doesn't. So that's what the U.S. Democratic Party does. They exploit identity politics. And sadly, I've noticed, and this kind of drives me a bit spare, really, and it's also a worry. I've noticed that a lot of people on the left and people who call themselves, um, and people who say they're on the left, uh, tend to use or tend to give as an, as an example of what's wrong with identity politics, what's wrong with, sorry, what's wrong with minority groups and, uh, and black people or whatever organizing, they use the Democratic Party's exploitation of identity politics as, as what this actually is. You know, it's like the, as, as, that it's a huge problem. Yes, it's a huge problem that the U.S. Democratic Party exploits identity politics and uses it. For example, Pete Buttigieg is, is gay and he's a Afghan veteran or something. Um, he's a neoliberal. He's, he's totally fine with war. He's, a, he's for um, pro-Israel and the whole thing. It makes no difference whatsoever if he's gay. Not, not one, I, uh, one difference um, if he's gay. Kamala Harris is, um, you know, a person of color. But she's totally uh, been happy throwing black people in prison and laughing about it. Um, you know, she's a real problem for black people. And she's totally imperialist. She's totally on board with any war. Any war is fine. She's totally on board with um, overthrowing Venezuela. And she doesn't care about the 40,000 Venezuelans who have been so far um, killed through U.S. crippling sanctions. All of that, you know, I could have a big long list about Kamala Harris. Juan, Juan Castro, he's Latino. So what? He's totally, an, I, I think he's an imperialist. He's a neoliberal. Anybody who was up on that stage that, um, you know, they've used 
in the democratic debates that's either um, a person of color or uh, sort of gay or whatever is 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 as problematic as the rest of them, even more so because it's almost like they're using that particular identity as like a, a Trojan horse to get in, and then they just do whatever the hell they want. You can one can guarantee that if Kamala Harris gets in, which is unlikely, I think Trump is going to win because the Democratic Party have just been shooting themselves in the face over and over again with Russia Gate and all that sort of thing, and they're they're ignoring people that actually have good domestic policies like Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is problematic. He's an imperialist, but he has good domestic policies. Come on, but just say Kamala Harris got in and became president of the United States. It'd be like Obama, 2.0. That's what it would be. She'd be totally on board with everything that's pro-Israel, giving them $10.5 million of military aid a day and keeping the apartheid situation and the, and the execution of Palestinians and all of that going. Worse, worse, worse than apartheid is happening in Palestine um, and apartheid Israel. That's what she'd be doing, and she'd be totally on board with any war that was brought to her. That's fine. You'd never see Medicare for all. You won't see any. You won't see any real change at all. And she, yet she's been. You'd swear she was some kind of lefty on Twitter most of the time, except for the war thing, which she doesn't mention. But you know, she's totally on board with that. So that's sort of Kamala Harris, and that's what would happen if she got in. Um, you know, th this whole using this Trojan horse using identity politics that the the Democratic Party does is a real problem. Uh, and I would have hoped, and I would hope that anybody who is making any commentary on the, on the left about the Democratic Party highlights the fact that that's what the Democratic Party does. That it, there is no problem with minority groups organizing themselves. There's no problems with LGBT people organizing themselves and black people organizing themselves and all that sort of thing. There's no, there, that should be, that's not a problem. What is a problem is when the, you know, politicians disingenuously, deceptively use uh, these, this idea of diversity and, you know, and all supportive of diversity that they proclaim to be. But in actual reality, it's, it's not like that at all. When they do that and they exploit it so that they can get people to vote for them, that's the problem. And I get so tired of, of sort of people not explaining that when they talk about ID politics and they talk about how problematic it is and all this sort of thing. ID politics used by the Democratic Party is problematic. People in various minority groups organizing for themselves and all of that is not problematic. What is problematic is if different minority groups and black people or whatever are only interested in their own issues and they don't see the wider picture of class and of imperialism and all of that. That is a problem when everybody is so focused on their own issue and, and they don't care about other people's struggles and they don't see that class struggle is also very, very important. That's a problem. But I see, you know, that's, uh, that's not just solely uh, minor minority groups uh, sort of, you know, for want of a wet, better word, blind spot. You know, they're, sorry, that's probably an able, that's an ableist term, but they're sort of um, an area that they do not see, an area that they do not see um, or think about. Any any group that is just focusing on their own thing and isn't looking at the wider picture, that's a problem. That is a big problem. And uh, we won't get anywhere if we're totally focused on only on our issues. I understand that any group that is, like, for example, trans people, that, that uh, any group that is being oppressed and killed like trans people are, particularly black trans women in the U.S., are being killed often. You know, there's a couple of dozen already this year have been killed. Um, I understand why um, there has to be a, a major push on some issues, and sometimes it can look like uh, groups are only focused on that. I totally get that. I mean, I was involved in a campaign uh, last year in the beginning of this year uh, for um, some legislation changes in Tasmania for, for trans people. And, you know, you, you have to, because there's so much bigotry on this issue and because uh, now that um, marriage equality is passed in different places in the world now, the um, sadly the Christian, and I put that in, in, in quotes, Christian bigots and other bigots are now turning on, trans, you know, making trying to find another issue, another group to vilify, and that happens to be trans people now, be, you know, because... It's not so easy to vilify now gay people because marriage equality is kind of passed and um, most of society in some ways is on board with and, and is accepting accepting of, uh, you know, gay people or whatever. 
sadly, um, it, it's sort of there's this small group of unfortunate people who like to, um, you know, who will sort of find a vulnerable group and then turn on them because it's easy to do so and because m most of the society isn't understanding of that group and so it's easy in some ways to sway people to turn on those particular groups because there's a lot of ignorance around trans issues. In fact, there's a lot of ignorance around trans, trans issues on the left. Um, it reminds me of when there was a lot of ignorance about the Palestine um, issue and people were afraid to say something because they really didn't understand what was going on because there's so much um, media propaganda about that and so much government propaganda about Palestine um, and that they're terrorists and they're this and they're that and they're they're just they're, they're born terrorists this kind of awful um, racist rhetoric that is put out there uh, well you know in some ways it's it's sort of been a bit like that or a lot like that in in the mainstream media in Australia in particular where they've even dedicated segments to of Australian newspapers like the Australian to dumping on trans people they literally have dedicated a section of the paper to doing that newspaper so um, it's not surprising that you know it, it, particularly when things when when there's a lot of social inequality in a country in any country when there's a lot of downturn of the economy due to neoliberalism or whatever neoconservative neo neoconservatism uh, when there's a lot of um, you know sort of people struggling the go governments try and focus their anger on and divide communities and they often will try and you know find a group to vilify if it's not Muslims it's trans people or whatever and that's what they do here in Australia the the right-wing government here um, the Scott Morrison government uh, all governments do it and they've been doing it throughout history rather than getting people it takes away the focus from them and what they're doing and the mess they're making and the how they're ignoring the public purpose how they how they're ignoring all of us to line their own pockets and to serve corporations and the military the industrial complex and all of that and in this case also in Australia the US Empire we serve the US Empire which is a vassal state here in Australia so anyway I'm, I'm just what I'm trying to say is that um, you know when Tulsi Gabbard say, says things like you know political correctness is attack on our freedoms what the hell does that mean I mean do we want to go back to the 50s where or the 60s or the 70s even where everybody was um, you know, it was fine to say whatever the hell you wanted about gay people or trans people weren't even on the radar then, but gay people, I happen to know, know because I belong to that group. I don't really like to label myself as gay. I'm not into labels very much at all. I don't like it. I think, why should I have to label myself uh, when heterosexual people don't have to label themselves? You know, why do I have to highlight myself? But anyway, uh, and also there's, you know, there's a lot more to me than, than that. Um, and I, I'm, and I consider myself fluid as well. So it's sort of like, I don't, I don't really like labels, but I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of bigotry because there is no, there was no political correctness at all in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, really, even in the 90s, you know. So I know what that's like, and it's not fun. I've had people. Uh, I'm even sure that there was somebody uh, had. Uh, we still can't be sure, but I'm even sure that we were. Um, targeted by someone and they actually uh, managed to um, kill one of our cats one time. This was only about 10 years ago now, um, which was appalling. Uh, so, but, you know, I, I, I'm sure that I've um, also missed out on positions and missed out on being included in things and uh, I've been um, excluded in my family um, and um, made invisible by um, relatives and fam close family. I've been, you know, all of that. I could, I've been um, sexually assaulted because of that. There's a whole list of things. And so, and that came from the fact that, um, you know, um, homophobia was, you know, really kind of, it wasn't really such a problem. You know, you could say stuff about gay people, that's fine. You know, really, because um, most people sort of didn't have much awareness about it. And also there was this underlying homophobia, fear of difference, you know, in a heterosexist society. That's what happens when you have a certain amount of ignorance about a group uh, in, in a society. You, and by the way, a lot of it is driven by these pretend, these faux Christians. You know, I've been bailed up outside a, um, a dance I went to in the... Um, in the late 80s, I was with my partner, um, and uh, these uh, 
pretend Christians were all standing around us, all happened to be men, and wouldn't let us go to our car. And luckily we weren't too far from the uh, actual dance that we were going to uh, because we were able to then, we were still within public view and we were able, we just went back inside the the, the dance, you know. So it's sort of like, um, you know, because we, we didn't want to be there surrounded by four or five of these pretend Christian, born-again Christian men and they were actually, um, there was a bunch of them outside in the front of the place, uh, you know, sort of this shouting sort of homophobic stuff. I mean, this is in the late 80s. You know, I've had police in Queensland, you know, pulling me up in my vehicle because I had, you know, sort of coloured hair or something at the time and I might have looked, uh, you know, their idea of um, what gay people look like or whatever and they'd pull me up and they'd basically search my car with... Uh, there would be other people there. They'd search my car because of how I looked. You know, it's been a long, like I could ream off for dozens and dozens of examples. Um, and I've had friends beaten up, women, mm. friends beaten up by um, drunken straight men that are misogynist outside of clubs and stuff. Anyway, it goes, it goes on and on. And this has a psychological impact on uh, people in LGBT groups. You know, it's in physical impacts and it, it sort of, it creates a lot of problems for individuals. Uh, and when you don't have any support at schools, which is what, and we didn't, I didn't have any support at school through primary school in the 60s and through high school in the 70s, you know. There was no support from my family or anything. They, they kind of, um, still even, really, they, they, they don't bother with me it, it, um, and or won't acknowledge it. Um, my mother is okay. She's welcoming of my partner, but she doesn't like to acknowledge things in, in an outward sense in a sort of a, um, even to us, you know, it's like this sort of, it's, it's, there's this acceptance of my partner, but it's also this non-acknowledgement that we're in a relationship. I mean, you know, it's all weird. Um, I'm probably uh, sort of saying too much about myself, but it's, it's, it, I'm just trying to get across that, you know, political correctness um, actually does affect people's behavior towards, it doesn't, it doesn't, eliminate it doesn't get rid of homophobia or transphobia or racism or sexism or misogyny or you know he, you know heterosexism etc it doesn't get rid of it but it makes people see that it's not okay to vilify minority groups just because they're a minority and in a democracy we're supposed to be protecting minority groups we're supposed to be protecting vulnerable groups and we're supposed to be protecting um you know different races and so forth. We're supposed to, you know, democracies, which there are none really, real democracies that I can see, but in a real democracy, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be looking after all people. We're supposed to be looking after all people. And I'm vegan, so we look after, um, we're supposed, we, sh we should really consider non-human animals too, the ones we eat, wear and use. Um, you know, we're supposed to be, we should be looking after all people and non-human animals, meaning when I say looking after non-human animals, I'm not talking about domesticating them and keeping them as pets in quotes and all of that. I'm talking about just not domesticating, not interfering, not exploiting, not using them as resources and property and so forth. So I thought I'd throw that in there talking about vulnerable groups because despite the fact that there's... um that we're only less than 1% of the planet's population and the rest are non-human animals. We are destroying their home and we're um, exploiting whom, whomever we can, whatever species we can, and species are dying off at 200 um, a day, 200 species a day, because we are partly because, or mostly, because we're consuming animal products. And it's destroying, it's causing, helping a major driver of the climate emergency. Anyway, so anyway, I'm getting off the track about Tulsi Gabbard and her, um, you know, comments about political correctness, which interestingly she didn't put on Twitter, which I, I find interesting. Why would you leave that out? I, unless, of course, you were running out of characters. Um, but anyway, um, so really, is that really something to be that concerned about? How about her position about her non-position, well, her position that she's taken about um, being against uh, the um, being against the BDS, the um, boycott, divestment, sanctions, which would help end apartheid Israel. 
and I'm doing them a favor by calling it apartheid because it's way, way worse than that. How about that? That's sort of like, isn't that sort of, is that American values? Whatever that means. What are American values? Please, please, somebody explain that to me. I don't even know what Australian values are anymore because it certainly isn't being demonstra demonstrated to me here in Australia, whatever they were. It used to be about fairness. It used to be. Fairness usually to white people, but um, <laughs> but it used to be about fairness. Anyway, so whatever American values are, does she think that supporting an, an, uh, a worse than apartheid regime that executes children and, and paramedics and paraplegics at the fence of, of an open-air prison that is Gaza, does she think that's American values? But she's against the BDS campaign, which is probably the only thing now that would end that. Really? So she's very selective of what she thinks is American values. And she's very selective with what she thinks is, is peace. She says she wants peace and she doesn't want war. Well, you know, if you don't want, if you want peace, then how about starting with not supporting a brutal occupation of a people where there's a genocide taking place? How about that? This sort of selective stuff that, that politicians do, it's, it's, it's very tiresome. But it's also, what's more, ben, but what can one expect from politicians? That's what I think. Sorry, um, Arun's getting very, very enthusiastic here on my lap. What, what does she mean by political correctness? I, I'd really, really like to, and this is the other thing that worries me about that. Um, about, that's the other thing that worries me about what Tulsi Gabbard said. I feel like it's a bit of a dog whistle to the right because that is something that people on the right tend to do. Uh, I'm not talking about everybody on the right, but most people on the right tend to do is they they do these uh, promotions of, you know, oh, political correctness, it's all, you know, it's all effed and it's ruining, ruining everything. And, um, you know, they're always complaining about, always complaining about it. And comedians sometimes complain about it. Uh, you know, that um, unfortunate Bill Maher, who's, you know, sort of an Islamophobe, and he complains about it. It's this thing, like, it's okay for minority groups and people who are disenfranchised. It's okay for them to maybe want a little bit of respect, but if you want full respect and you and you want to be sort of considered like we, heter in a heteronormative, white, um, sort of do dominated society, then that's too much. It's too much. It's too much to ask, and we it's getting it's getting a little bit too much like that. So we want that to stop. You know, um, that that's what that sort of says. I feel like there's even people on the left, and I you know that are sort of doing that. It's like, oh, you know, it was okay. You, yeah, you got your marriage equality now. Shut the fuck up, sort of thing. You know, uh, now everything's fine. You you're able to marry. That's great. And now now stop stop with it. Is there um, sort of people that take things too far and take political correctness to a ridiculous degree? Yes, of course there is. Uh, in every group, every group, there are sort of extreme people. And in some cases, uh, people will, in some cases, there are sort of people who are intentionally doing that, trying to destroy movements. You get it, you get it in all kinds of movements. You know, you get it in... Um, all over the place, you know, there'll be people that are almost like Asian provocateurs that are trying to basically destroy movements and pit people against one another. I mean, there was actually a 4chan thing where they were trying to, um, <clears throat> 4chan was trying to put bisexual people against pansexual people and saying that bisexual people are for this binary thing, which means they're anti, that they're anti-trans, they're transphobic. And they were trying to do that. There are people that are actually trying to stir up shit all the time. Does it mean, though, that, say, if somebody from a trans group does something that's outrageous or sort of wants something that seems, seems might seem, you know, out there, that, that then we take that as, the, as an example of the whole group? This is the, these fallacies that of taking, of generalizing about a whole group based on somebody who's done something that might be extreme or off. It's like what I experience sometimes when, you, you know, as a vegan, the way that the governments and um, and certain you know corporations are trying to vilify vegans and make out like vegans are um, you know sort of some kinds of extremists or something because maybe there was a few people that may have um, sort of I don't know stopped some traffic or they they've done some I don't agree with these actions where people are um, going into restaurants and, and um, shouting at people that that's actually not going to make anybody stop 
eating animal products and using animals, shouting at them and trying to humiliate them in a restaurant or whatever. But they'll use, and oftentimes those people that do that, they're not actually vegan. They're actually, um, in some ways, some of them are misanthropists, but they're, they actually aren't, they aren't vegans. And, and act, in actual fact, um, groups like, say, Direct Action Everywhere actually argue against veganism like because it gets in more people to uh, their group if they don't challenge anybody to go vegan. So they get people in their groups and people making donations and these people think they're discharging their moral responsibility by making donations and they don't have to go vegan. They don't have to stop. You know, you can't be an animal rights activist if you're still eating, wearing, using animals. You cannot be an animal lover. I hate that term. If you're still eating, wearing and using animals, you cannot be that. Okay. So anyway, but what I'm saying is that People will use, you know, examples of people, you know, shouting at people in restaurants and trying to humiliate them as an example of what vegans are and then try and generalize about all vegans based on a, on a couple of people. So that, that's what happens with this sort of, you know, um, oh, the political correctness, it's just, it's just outrageous and it's gone too far, you know, this political correctness gone too far. I feel like that is, that is used disingenuously as a pushback on I, you know, this sort of an, even if it's an unconscious bigotry towards different minority groups and say black people, etc. It's an unconscious bigotry of sort of, are they just getting too many, they're just getting, they're, they're starting to get equal rights with us and we don't like it. And we don't like having to watch our P's and Q's and we don't like, you know, we feel like we should be able to just say whatever the hell we want or say, say the occasional um, sort of slur against them, you know, and that should be okay. And some people just want us to go back to the, to how it was where you could just say whatever the hell you wanted about, you know, gay people or trans people or black people or whatever, and, and that it's just fine, thank you very much. There's a lot of people just want to go back to that. They just, they, they, it just, it's too much effort. Firstly, they've got those bigotries there, so they just want to be able to return to that. And it, as I said, having political correctness doesn't, uh, doesn't, um, get rid of these, um, this, these forms of bigotry. People will still say all sorts of effed things in private. You know, they, they will, and they do. Um, to think that, say, marriage equality, now everything is hunky-dory, uh, that, that people, a lot of, most people aren't homophobic is, is uh, just deluding ourselves. But it certainly does help when you don't have to listen to or have people shouting at you things or being, or, or that it's, or that, um, um, you have to deal with oppression in, in a kind of a private way because uh, the rest of society is just not caught up to speed or on board with with this sort of thing. The fact that we even had to do a marriage equality survey a couple of years ago where people in Australia, it was a survey, people in Australia were asked, do you think that um, same-sex people should be allowed to marry? I had to participate in that survey. You know, it was disgusting. Imagine if, you know, if you had, a, if uh, you were a heterosexual person and you had uh, people having a survey in your country, should, uh, you know, um, opposite sex attracted people be allowed to marry? Imagine, imagine being involved in that and having to participate in that. I mean, that, that's, that's a sort of, you know, it's sort of outrageous, really. But anyway, so I'm, I'm really raving on here and, and it's a bit of a vent and a bit of a rant because I've just seen so many different commentators now um, on the left, and uh, I don't watch the right really, but you know, it, it doesn't take much to sort of see them dumping on minority groups and wishing everything would go back to the 50s, 60s and 70s. But on the left, people inadvertently, whether they realize it or not, are dumping on minority groups when they start to vilify identity politics, how it is presented by the Democratic Party, how it is exploited by the Democratic Party. And I wish that people would explain that I, you know, that Identity politics and, and groups that are organizing, that are minority groups or whatever, that is, t that is totally fine and necessary, but, and it has nothing to do with how the Democratic Party is exploiting identity politics. It has nothing to do with that. And I sometimes wonder whether, you know, it, it feels like a pushback from the, some of the, on the left and, and on the right. It feels like this push, pushback on, on progress. And yes, some people, a small m number of people, whether they are doing it in a deliberate way to be divisive or whether they are just sort of gone, gone sort of ridiculous, have exploited, um, you know, have sort of taken some things too far. Nothing, but the general population of, of those particular groups 
probably don't go with that, don't endorse that. People in in disenfranchised groups and in minority groups or whatever just want to be treated like everybody else, which isn't so good these days um, with neoliberal governments as they are, but they just want to be treated as everybody else. They don't want to be um, isolated or uh, excluded and they want equal rights they and they want to be they don't want to be tolerated uh, they want to be accepted and uh, and that's all that's all there is to it really you know it's no biggie and political correctness is not an awful thing trust me it wasn't fun when there wasn't any in the 60s 70s and 80s it wasn't it was fucked and it caused a lot of violence to my friends to me um, which you know I still pay for uh, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's not fun and we should not be going along with it or being silent about it. And we should be trying to, um, it, it, it clarify the whole U.S. Democratic Party's exploitation of diversity and all of that and expose it for the Trojan horse that it is to get, you know, to just make people vote for them, to get people, to get votes, to get in. But they don't care about those groups. So we should make it make it differentiate between that, and I, I don't appreciate. I don't. I don't know what Tulsi Gabbard means when she said that that's a, an attack on freedom of speech and all of that. This political correctness. I don't know what she means, but putting it out there like that in a generalized way is is at the very least problematic. And I really feel, in some ways, it's a dog whistle to the right because she wants as many people to vote for her as possible. She's trying to bring people in, just like supporting. The anti-BDS legislation was a dog whistle to any to the to the Zionists, to anybody that's pro-Israel, and also that the Democratic Party would like that too because they get a lot of lobbying money from APAC, from the Israel lobby. So it's her way of pleasing the Israel lobby, and she's been pleasing the Israel lobby for a long time. She gave a speech at Christians United for Israel, which is an extreme right-wing group. Um, she gave that in 2015. Nobody mentions that, but it, it's a really full-on speech. You should watch it. And I, th I still believe she probably holds a lot of those um, beliefs that and those things she mentioned in that speech because she never really clarifies her position about whether, as President of the United States, she would still give Israel $1.5 million every day um, of military aid. She hasn't said that. She hasn't said she re rejects what she said in that 2015 speech to Kufi, um, you know, because nobody can really pin her down on that. But she's got, um, but I would say that she's pro-Israel pretty clearly now, you could say that, and that means that she's pro um, a genocide of Palestinians because that's what's going on. You know, they openly call for genocide in against Palestinians in Israel, a lot of the population. And uh, the government is totally right-wing and totally is trying to, to do that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's all you can say about that. So anyway, um, this isn't really just about Tulsi Gabbard, but I don't appreciate her putting that out there on top of everything else. And I think that's really unfortunate. And I don't appreciate, um, you know, people who call themselves left on the left, sort of, um, misrepresenting what identity politics, you know, misrepresenting, uh, the struggles of minority groups by, using the US Democratic Party's exploitation of identity politics. I don't I don't appreciate that and I wish people would fucking stop that. Because it's actually undoing whether they realize it or not it's actually um because there's no explanation, no clarification, it's actually in some ways to a degree dumping on the on minority groups that are struggling and trying to organize. Anyway, that's really all I wanted to say so thanks so much for watching. Um, I hope I explained that properly. I hope that I have got things clear. I, I'd like somebody to ask Tulsi Gabbard to, uh, to clarify what she's talking about with identity politics, what examples she could give. Uh, that would be interesting. Okay, so um, please subscribe if you haven't already. Click the notifications bell. Otherwise, you don't receive notifications when I drop a video. Um, please like if you like the content. And uh, thanks so much for watching. My name is Trish Roberts. You're watching Faint Signals from Vigo. Till next time. Bye for now.